Hello everybody. It's been a while since I uploaded, and I just wanted to make a little presentation about the most important information that I've learned so far. I'm going to talk about the strategy I'll be using in depth, and I would also like to briefly talk about the power of this strategy in regards to the trading anxiety that almost everybody experiences. I am doing this as a teaching presentation, because teaching something in your own words is the best way to commit information to your brain long term. If you need to pass a test and you only have one day, just memorize it using flashcards. If you want to remember something for the rest of your life, pretend that you are presenting it to a class. It's a neat psychological trick I learned in college. For information I don't care about, I can memorize pages and pages of difficult concepts in ASA test while having hardly any idea what it actually means. But when I want to actually understand something, the process is much more demanding but rewarding. Remember, knowledge is not understanding. I can tell you that E equals MC squared, but what the heck does that even mean? Even if I say what those letters stand for, I still don't really understand it. So I'm doing this presentation because it will benefit my own learning experience, and hopefully I can help you as well. This presentation is the accumulation of well over 50 hours of watching videos, since 99% of trading information is garbage. It took over 50 hours to find just a few hours worth of really helpful videos. Sorry for the rambling, let's do this. So very briefly, let's go over the only part of supply and demand that helps us understand trading. For both buyers and sellers, there are prices that are desirable, and there are prices that are undesirable. There is no need to make it more complicated than that. I stop buying ice cream when it becomes $5 a quart, and I start buying it again when it goes down to $3 a quart. When price gets too high, the big institutional traders who actually move the market start selling, and when it gets low, they buy back in. The people who have enough money to actually move the market are not looking at 30 second or 1 minute charts. They are looking at the bigger time frames, waiting to get a good deal. Remember the law of supply. The higher the price of something, the more sellers will sell it. Smart money is not buying huge positions at an all time high. Why would they do that when they could just wait a week and buy it for a much better price? Remember, when demand exceeds supply, it goes up. When supply exceeds demand, it goes down. All that means is that when it gets to a good buying price, big money steps in and chews through all of the sell orders to drive it up. When it gets to a good price to sell, there are more sellers than there are buyers, which causes the price to go down. The cool part about this is that we can use volume profiles to actually see how the quantity of trades is changing at different levels of the market. Remember, do not let the stock market terminology confuse you. Almost everything is simple, and the only thing that can make the market seem overwhelming is because it's a new language. There are all of these fancy words that economists and big money traders like to use, but remember. No matter how complicated the formulas are for creating indicators for technical analysis, and no matter how many lines of code are being used for a computer that does trading automatically, almost everything boils down to buy low, sell high, and sell high, buy low. Of course, you can make things more complicated by shorting implied volatility or going long on implied volatility with options, but that's irrelevant. And the point I'm trying to make is that no matter how many new words there are to learn, and how overwhelming it can seem, all of the concepts in this style of trading are very easy. It's so confusing to me when I hear all of these internet experts talking about how we need some edge or new system to be profitable. How about I just follow what's happening instead of trying to write some VWAP moving average stochastic RSI overbought oversold formula which incorporates data from the chicken market since I found it to have a positive correlation with the S&P 500 on the first Tuesday of every month except for February. Come on now. We don't need to do that. The only thing we need to know is how to follow in the shadow of the people and the computers that move the markets. Isn't it much easier to point at a chart and say, hey, look at that. The price is stalling out where it went up really fast yesterday. Let's go long here and see if it happens again, and just set a stop loss directly below the low for a tiny risk and big reward. Let's very briefly mention our risk reward ratios. A 1 to 3 risk reward ratio means that you are either going to take a loss of 1 point or win 3 points. For ES, the futures for the S&P 500, this means that you are risking $50 to make $150. 
since one point has four ticks, and each tick is $12.50. This also means that it would take three losses to wipe out the profits of one good trade. For supply and demand trading, the strength is that it has really well-defined risk and really well-defined profit-taking levels. So you don't need to have a super high win rate for it to work. For the chart on the right, you can see that even if we change our risk reward to be very conservative down to 1 to 2, to break even we only have to be right one third of the time. Now let's do a little lesson on the relationship between anxiety and trading. Anxiety in everyday life usually stems from feelings of uncertainty. What's going to happen tomorrow? Did I forget to turn the stove off? What if these people don't like me? Are they huggers or do they prefer handshakes? All of these questions are relatable for people with generalized anxiety and social anxiety. This anxiety, whether it manifests as shaking, sweating, faster heart rate, or sickness, is stemming from cognitive processes about the unknown. We fear the unknown, and we also worry about it. We don't know if the elevator is going to work, we don't know how fun the party will be, and we have detrimental thought processes which have physical manifestations. So, how does this relate to trading? I had anxiety about trading when I was scalping Tesla options. It manifested as shaking, stomach pain, an increase in heart rate, and more. This happened because my plan was never really that clear. I had a plan, and I traded the plan, but there was so much mysteriousness and guesswork going on that I never really felt that confident. Now that I'm looking at trading the S&P 500, supply and demand imbalances don't make me feel like that. These setups have a clear risk and reward, a set stop loss, and a set profit taking level. Anxiety about trading implies a lack of confidence. If we can remove as many variables as possible when we take a setup, we can reduce that anxiety. The solution to reducing trading anxiety is to find a strategy that you can be confident about, and then use the computer to execute as much of the entire order as possible. Remove human error and human emotions, and your thesis about a trade will be optimized. Let's take a look at this chart I borrowed from the internet. We short at supply zones, and we go long at demand zones. The green rectangle is the zone that we want to short at, so let's see how we created it. For supply zones, the bottom of the rectangle starts at the open of the last bullish candle before the drop. The top of the zone starts at the most recent high before the drop. If your intuition has told you, but that's just waiting for a bounce off resistance, yeah, you're kinda right, but it's more than that. You never would have gotten in on this trade if you were waiting for a bounce off of resistance. However, we knew that this was a trade signal to take it short after it left the supply zone. For demand, the bottom is the most recent low before the big move up. The top is the open of the last bearish candle. Here is another example. And here is one more. The candle you're drawing the demand zone off of must be bearish. If it happens to be bullish, you need to go back and locate the nearest bearish candle before the move up and draw your rectangle from there. This is for the top of the demand zone. Now, I don't know how valid this statement is, but it is important because we don't want to take a trade that has already moved a lot. There is a good chance that it's going to turn around, which is why this strategy is good for finding out when those turnarounds, aka reversals, are going to happen. Also, part of the idea that this strategy is based on is order flow. The price comes back to a zone that it once left very quickly, and, when it returns, hypothetically there are still leftover orders sitting in that zone that will drive the price out of there just like it did the first time. So. You can't just keep coming back to a zone and reversing. Eventually, those orders will be chewed through. Also, let's keep in mind that support and resistance lines are still valid. So just because a zone may have lost its power, it doesn't mean that there won't be more battles going on at important price levels. It may reverse again, but not because of leftover orders. This picture on the right is just so you can see that if we wait for confirmation that the price is going to leave the zone, we can take profit right below or above the next zone. For example, I see that price is leaving the demand zone at the bottom. I set an order with a profit take, one tick below the entrance to the supply zone, and maybe I set my stop loss just below the entrance to the demand zone. This would be super safe, 
but maybe I want to get out if this isn't a move that immediately goes back up. Now, ignore the picture and listen to these important notes. Lots of small consolidation with a small breakout is not a strong setup. Huge moves are from institutional influence, and those are the levels that matter to us, because they are the ones who make the big stuff happen. Additionally, we can use volume profile to show us the price levels where the most volume is happening. So, we can volume profile the supply and demand zones to see where all of the action is happening. I'm waiting for TD Ameritrade to finish the paperwork for my account so I can use Thinkorswim for charting, since it has all of the good tools for analysis. Also, Trader Workstation with Interactive Brokers is absolute garbage for charting, but I'll still be executing my trades there. This is quantifying order flow imbalances. You can see where the sellers are. If this top supply zone can be broken, then you know that the next zone is going to be tough to break through, and it will only get harder because the further up the price goes, the more attractive the price will become to sellers. When you have an established plan before the price gets to this zone, you are trading proactively instead of reactively. I'd also like to note something that I think is important here. What we are looking at is an opportunity to buy where that circle is on the far right, expecting it to get close to that first supply zone. Do you see what I see though? If I took this trade, I would have looked to take my profit if the price didn't almost immediately break through that resistance line I just drew. If it does get through, we would look to see if it could get through that zone, and then we would just keep on holding until it failed to break a zone. Let's take a look at one of my new favorite phrases, don't diddle in the middle. Catchy, easy to remember, and smart. What kind of magic indicator is going to tell me what I'm supposed to do with a statistically significant level of accuracy during this choppy stuff between these two zones? VWAP? No. 9EMA? No. The only way you trade chop that looks like this is with a good risk to reward ratio and just start guessing. However, after we drew this green zone on the bottom, if we wait for price to leave and go long, taking our profit right before the supply zone, that's a big win. We don't need to win that often for this to be a good strategy. Remember, don't diddle in the middle because when the market gets choppy, trading gets sloppy. There's another one for you. Now, a brief intermission. Let me just remind you that this presentation is happening because teaching something, in your own words, is the best way for the human brain to store information long term. And I might even teach you something or spark an idea that leads to you improving your trading life. I haven't even done a single trade with this yet, and let me also make something clear. We're not going to see an A plus setup every day. In fact, maybe just three times a week we will see a great setup, but the methodology is so good that this is all that we need to become consistently profitable. More trades don't equal more money. Perhaps one week from now I will have different opinions on supply and demand zones and the other technicalities involved here. Okay. Let's get back to it. What are these zones created from? Peaks and valleys, which are just another name for market turning points. Peaks refer to the top of the area where price turns to the downside after a move up. They become areas of supply and are created by a rally base drop formation. We've got some new vocab here, but take it easy. They're self-explanatory. A rally goes up, a base is the consolidation where it just hangs out for a bit, and the drop is, well, the drop. It would be easier just to call them up sideways downs, but we all know that if it has something to do with the stock market, we have to give it a special name to make ourselves sound smarter than we really are. Valleys refer to the bottom of the area where price turns to the upside after a move down. They become areas of demand and are created by a drop base rally formation. Yep. You've got it. That just means down sideways up. The strongest setup is going to start from a huge and fast move, and you should ask yourself, don't you think we left some buyers there? If it moves super fast, there wasn't enough time for these big orders to get filled. So, when it returns to these zones, why should we believe that it won't get bought back up and rally again? I'd also like to note that these two demand zones are based off a zone that isn't in this picture. It's from the previous slide, so if you notice that the second zone actually goes below the low of where the arrow is pointing and thought to yourself, wait a minute, 
that just broke through the demand zone. Great job paying attention. Rally base rally refers to a continuation pattern controlled by the bulls. This can act as an area of demand for upcoming trade setups. If the price comes back to this base, it would be a good idea to get long here. Drop base drop refers to a continuation pattern controlled by the bears. This can act as an area of supply for upcoming trade setups. So, if the price comes back up to the base, it would be a good idea to get short here. Let's also remind ourselves that this formation just looks good to go short after it breaks the consolidation slash base. Flag patterns and pennant patterns are very high probability. We have to remember not to overcomplicate how easy it can be to make money when it's in a clear down or uptrend. Larger time frames are more important because that's what big money is paying attention to. They are more aware of this stuff. They don't care about some weird technical analysis baloney like an inverse triple waterfall, butterfly swordfish guitar pick, or whatever you want to call it forming on the 200 tick charts. If we want to make big money, let's follow what big money is doing. And we have an amazing advantage over them, since individually, our orders don't influence the market. We get all of the benefits of riding those huge waves they create without actually causing any ourselves. Now, on the charts, we do a top-down approach. This begins with the larger time frame first, and then we work our way down to the time frame we will be placing our trades on. Some helpful information is, choose a maximum of three time frames to view, and do not overanalyze the market. Do not look at 10 different time zones or you'll psych yourself out. All we need is the daily chart, hourly chart, and then the 5 or 15 for our entries. Less than that is all noise and stuff we should not care about. We want to know what kind of trend the market is in overall, and then we want to know what it's doing this week and today. It does not need to be more complicated than that. The 5 and 15 are best for supply and demand. Remember, the more the price drops down, the less desirable that price becomes to the sellers, so why would we not believe that it's going to come back up? Simultaneously, that price becomes desirable to the buyers. You don't want to become a buyer after a large rally, and you never want to become a seller after a huge sell-off. Okay? Let's do an analogy to surfing. I've never surfed, but the concept is not difficult. However, if you get on the board at the very end of the wave, I'd probably tell you that you suck at surfing. We use supply and demand zones to identify where these big waves are building up, and then we ride them to their destination on shore. And when we get back into the water, we have a general idea of where another wave is probably going to start again. So we wait there patiently and ride it again. Let's briefly return to my favorite phrase. Don't diddle in the middle. When it's choppy, you'll have a hard time convincing me you're not just gambling with good risk management if you're diddling in the middle. Yes, by definition, all trading is gambling, but hopefully you get my point. We have no idea which direction has higher probability in the middle, but when it's in a supply or demand zone, there's a good probability as to which direction it will move. Now, I like this picture for a few reasons. This is ES on the 5 minute chart, which is the futures for the mini S&P 500. You can see that we will have big trading opportunities and smaller ones. It dipped into that demand zone that I drew, so we could go long there. Then, we would have sold it about 25 minutes later after it got up to the high of day and failed to break through it. Now, that was only a few points, but it was still a clean setup. These are the only patterns we need in order to trade. Reversals have a rally base drop and a drop base rally, where base becomes the zones to trade. And the other ones just have a small base where it stalls out before continuing to move in the original direction. The continuation patterns create supply and demand zones at their base as well. The speed at which price left the area determines the strength of the imbalance in price. We don't want to see a bunch of little candles. We want to see a few big candles, which you can see on the left. The faster it leaves an area, the higher probability the price will turn there again. This is a very good demand zone because of how fast it left. You'll notice it didn't stay there for very long either. Now. The supply zone isn't that good because it moved very slowly, so it wouldn't be a good idea to short when it got back into that area. If price arrives into a level with few candles, which just means fast, 
price is offering a larger profit potential for upcoming trades. This is due to no opposing order flow being close to the entry, which is just saying that not a lot of people want to sell right there. But they do want to buy. So, let's just follow them and make some money. If price enters the level very slowly, there's a higher probability that price will continue in the current direction. This is very important, and, in this case, it is referring to the speed at which the price enters a supply zone. It is saying that the faster the price jumps in there, even if it was consolidating in the middle for a while, the stronger the chance is that it will reverse out of the zone. Let's look at an example. See how fast it returned to the supply zone at those two candles? That's what's important. We don't care about all of the choppiness after it left supply and before it got to the two candles that went flying into the zone. It can move around like this. What's important is how it eventually moved in. Here, it did it really fast in just two candles, so it's good. We can call this a clean arrival. The less time it spends at the base slash consolidation, the stronger the level is. It shows a clear decision and no battle. If it leaves very fast, then the chance of orders being left in that zone are higher. If it's at the base for a long time, there's a good chance that order flow is already consumed, so when we return to the level, the probability of it holding is lower. Remember to ask the question, don't you think we left some buyers there? This is a good base. It went in and then immediately rallied out. Even though you'd like to see it leave this zone faster after it came back, the buyers are still in control. This is a good setup, but sometimes we have to be patient, which is something I personally have to work on. That's why we set the stop loss one tick under the demand zone. Now, I want you to look at this chart and see if you see another clean setup. I'll wait five seconds. Do you see the supply zone up there? That's a great looking setup. Remember that we need to be aware of the overall trend of the market. Something you may have also noticed is that not everyone makes these zones the same. I made this one by extending the rectangle from the opening price of the last bullish candle and the most recent high. Some people use percentages of the first candle out. Let's also remember that we need market context to make judgments about whether our zones are going to result in the movements we are hoping for. Not every zone is going to work, of course. This isn't a magical indicator, and I'm not selling you anything. I don't even know how to actually do it yet. I'm just making this to quantify my own research and to make use of my notes. Notes aren't useful unless you use some sort of method to commit them to memory. Let's talk about actually doing the order from start to finish. Let's say the price has dipped into the demand zone at the bottom, and it has now just barely left. I will buy one ES futures contract, and, by the way, this strategy seems to do well with all forms of trading, since supply and demand is a fundamental part of all markets. My profit target is going to be right below that supply zone, and my stop loss will be one tick below the demand zone. That's very small risk for a great reward. Additionally, if I'm right, I'll probably drag that stop loss up as time goes on so I can at least lock in some profits or break even. Of course, this would be the opposite process for selling a supply zone or shorting the market. One thing that we need to watch out for when going long are resistance levels between demand and supply. These levels are still significant. And when we short the market, we need to watch out for support levels between the zones as well. Remember, we're going to be wrong sometimes. We need market context to have better informed decisions. It's really easy to get a picture where the strategy works. And something I have to remind myself is that this isn't the be-all end all of trading. I'm sure I'll find something else on my own or from someone else that makes a lot of sense, which I can add to my arsenal of trading strategies. In the markets, we need to be adaptive. Survival of the fittest extends to every aspect of life, including economics and the market. It's easy to see Darwinism at work in the markets, and the statistics about how many day traders fail exist because of the failure to adapt. Adapting is what I will do until I can do this successfully. I'm never going to give up, because even if there was only one person who could do this successfully, 
then that's good enough for me to persevere until I become the second one. There are so many ways to make money, and, as the only animals on earth with a sense of self and an often destructive ego, we love to overcomplicate things. We do not need 50 magical indicators or a million petabytes of data run by a building full of supercomputers running statistical analysis and correlation tests in order to become consistently profitable. This is something I have to remind myself when I experience information overload, and you should keep this in mind as well. We overcomplicate things. It's what we're best at. At its core, supply and demand just means we like things when they are cheaper and we like to sell things when it makes us money. The market fluctuates between these two areas while simultaneously following an uptrend, usually. The market moves sideways between important areas, and, in an uptrend, we just need to hold a position and ignore the noise to make money. We don't need a cutting-edge strategy, we just need to be good followers.